I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Professor Robert Paxton tonight. Robert did his PhD at Sussex University, and then I think I first met him when he was working at Cardiff University with Professor Picard. And from then he moved on to Uppsala in Sweden and Tübingen in Germany, and then quite a long stint at Queen's University Belfast. And then for quite a number of years now, he's been a professor at uh, the University of Halle. And during his career, he's studied solitary bees and, and a whole range of different biological questions. But today he's going to talk about bee diseases and uh, the title is Pathogen Spillover from B to B. So Robert Paxton. Thank you, Norman. Thanks for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And in acknowledgement of the terrible things that are happening in Ukraine, Dobrik Vechia, I think if I've got that right, good afternoon in Ukrainian. So I'll acknowledge straight away the CB Dennis Trust that are supporting or sponsoring this lecture. What do we mean by pathogen spillover? I think probably we're all acutely aware of pathogen spillover following the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic that is still affecting much of our lives. In Germany, meetings are held with masks, mostly remotely. What has happened with SARS-CoV-2 can define for us pathogen spillover. A virus, SARS-CoV-2, has been transmitted from a wild animal to humans. We have a cross-species transmission from ostensibly a reservoir host to a recipient or alternative host, which is us, Homo sapiens. Whether that virus subsequently transmits within the alternative host species or not is immaterial. Spillover is defined as that movement or that transmission from reservoir to recipient or alternative host species. Unfortunately, as we know with SARS-CoV-2, you know, it's spread through populations, through cities, through countries. So we know quite a lot about it now. Where it actually comes from is still a matter of debate. We have data, or there exist a lot of sequence data, of similar viruses to SARS-CoV-2 from bats. Whether it has entered the human population through an intermediate host, the pangolin, for example, or more likely the raccoon dog, or directly from bats is still an open question. The data don't exist to, uh, to be able to define that, at least up until a couple of weeks ago. Unlike some of these other viruses, which are closely related to SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-1, that is, uh, has been transmitted through civet cats to humans from bats, and uh, MERS coronavirus that was transmitted through the camel to humans in the early 2000s. But we do have an awful lot of data on SARS-CoV-2 since it's got into human populations. There are over 10 million sequences, full genome sequences of this RNA virus that have been submitted to public databases. And they provide a wonderful resource which allows us to understand, if not where it's come from, at least where it's going to. This is an image that I've recently pulled out of a nature paper showing the, the little dots represent different mutants on the genome. And you can see they're coloured according to, for example, Delta that was around in 2021, showing a lot of different variants here or mutations from the original uh, in grey that came into the human population. And most recently, in late 2021, we've got the Omicron variants, which again show quite a substantive, well, 20, 30, 40 mutations away, so-called SNPs, away from the uh, original that came into human. Uh, and that is spreading uh, so widely now, uh, unfortunately. Also in Germany, most of the um, new Omicron cases are this. 
But using these whole genome sequences, it's possible to build a phylogeny and say something about how this SARS-CoV-2 is moving. And here I'd like to show you a phylogeny, uh, which is on the left here, which is based upon complete genome sequences of SARS-CoV-2 in a paper that I think is about to come out in Nature Communications. This is the work of Tan Balu et al. from UCL, University College London. Uh, and what you can see here is each line represent a sequenced genome. Uh, and you can see the phylogeny puts the one close together. Uh, so gamma, for example, is distributed down here. This is the original variant that came into humans. Uh, we've got here the Delta variant that was so prevalent early in 2021. And please note that there is no Omicron in this. But what I would like to point out in particular are these lines here which lead to the hosts because it's clear that SARS-CoV-2 has, after entering the human population, it has jumped and spilt over from humans into dogs, cats, where it's been transmitted onwards amongst cats, uh, ferrets, where it's been transmitted into ferrets from humans, and from ferrets back into humans again, uh, a white-tailed deer in the USA most recently, and also in large cats. And in the white-tailed deer case, it's clear that it's entered the white-tailed deer in the US repeatedly in different locations, and that it is onwardly transmitting within white-tailed deer, which is not a good uh, piece of information because it means it's going to be very difficult to actually eradicate SARS-CoV-2 from the US and probably from other locations uh, where it has entered wild animals. So we've got SARS-CoV-2, a virus that's come into the human population, spilt over from wildlife. And this has happened repeatedly in the history of humans. We only have to think of other diseases such as smallpox, another virus that has been transmitted uh, from uh, wild animals into humans tuberculosis and the plague, both of which those latter two are bacteria that have come in from wild animals into the human population. And another example would be measles, which probably is derived from rinderpest, which has entered the human population probably uh, soon after agriculture was established. Uh, we're talking about uh, several thousand years ago, and it's probably derived from rinderpest. And I'm going to go on to rinderpest now because it's another interesting example of a spillover event. And I'm going to suggest, I've, I'm highlighting this one because I'm going to suggest that there might be some parallel between rinderpest and honeybees and the spillover from honeybees. So many of these pathogens that I've spoken about are RNA viruses. They have high mutation rates and high recombination rates, so they adapt quickly or relatively quickly to new hosts liable to jump into and be transmitted across species. Rinderpest itself is thought to be an Asiatic virus that uh, infects cattle or infected cattle and as a consequence of the cattle then being moved around the world has uh, invaded cattle populations in Europe where it caused big problems in the Middle Ages uh, and more recently. Uh, in the late 1890s, so just over a century ago, Cattle were taken from India to Africa with rinderpest. Rinderpest was not known in Africa at the time, but it spread rapidly like wildfire through the cattle population of Africa, such that you can see in this picture, which I've taken from Wikipedia, throughout Africa, 80 to 90% of all cattle were killed by rinderpest. Now you might say, Robert, okay, so that's a cattle transmitted disease, what's that got to do with spillover? Well, in this case, just like SARS-CoV-2 has spilt over from humans back into wild animals, rinderpest has spilt or spilt over from cattle into wild ungulates in uh, Africa and killed untold, unforetold numbers of wildebeest, giraffe, warthogs and buffalo and had a major ecological impact upon the environment, not only changing the ecology, leading to uh, growth of uh, thorny shrubs, uh, 
lion populations crashed at the Ngorongoro Crater as a consequence of the um, Rinderpest spillover into wild animals. The lions themselves were not infected, but there was a lack of uh, prey for them to hunt and also led to starvation amongst human populations in uh, the early 20th century when there were con uh, ongoing outbreaks of uh, rinderpest. I should say there's a silver lining here. Rinderpest is now being eradicated from the world by the United Nations FAO, so it's uh, no longer in existence, uh, at least out in the wild. But there might be a parallel there to what's happening in honeybees. Uh, and I'm going to repeatedly come back to this conceptual image of we've got diseases in honeybees being transmitted amongst honeybees quite readily that may themselves get over into wild bee species. Uh, and this is a problem which many have now recognised as a potential problem. And here I want to explore to what extent that's happening and how much of a problem that might be. OK, so let's first of all cover honeybees and their pathogens. There are a lot of different pathogens of honeybees that are known partly because honeybees have been so well studied. The ones I've focused on are viral diseases because I think they're largely responsible for colonies that have been collapsing since the last 15 years. Many people, I think we generally in the scientific community, we blame the varroa mite. And I think many people then also blame not only the varroa mite, but the viruses they, they, they transmit, particularly deformed wing virus that causes uh, these deformed wings that you can see on the B image on the, uh, the left-hand side. And it's probably causal in these elevated colony losses. I should say that we have not been immune to that here at Halle. Uh, we've lost several colonies in exactly the same way, collapsing over winter treated too late, bees full of deformed wing virus, genotype B. Okay, but the Varroa situation is another spillover event, as I think many of you will be aware, Varroa uh, destructor um, is, or otherwise Varroa mite, is originally associated with Apis serrana in South and East Asia. And it jumped across, it spilt over into the Western honeybee, the Apis mellifera that we manage in Europe, Africa, and actually nowadays throughout the world. And those, it spilt over and was brought to Europe and also to South and then to North America. So as a consequence of us moving honeybee colonies around the world. So it's a spillover event. When it got into Europe, the Varroa mite, at the same time in Europe, picked up deformed wing virus that's resident in Europe. And in this study of uh, Lena Wilfert et al, from as she was at the time at um, University of Exeter um, in Cornwall campus, she has showed quite clearly on the basis of gene sequences, phylogenies, that the, varro that the deformed wing virus subsequently spread throughout the world, including back to South and East Asia, with further movement of honeybees and their varroa mites. So we've got one virus that's been clearly, we know is transmitted by varroa, and uh, that is now spread around the world. So we wanted to know, okay, is this the only virus? You know, it's the one that I spend a lot of time working on because it seems to be associated with decline of honeybees. Is it the only virus that's associated with varroa mites? So we sampled honeybee colonies in uh, locations in red, which were adjacent to in green locations uh, where we sampled additional honeybees where there were at the time no varroa mites. And then we screened those honeybee colonies with varroa mites and without varroa mites. Given that they were in close physical proximity, we thought, well, probably the virome, the viral complement that they have is likely to be similar, but for the fact of varroa. So we can see by statistically analyzing those 14 viruses that we screened in all of those honeybees, and it's uh, over 600 colonies that we screened, we can see what what consequence varroa parasitism can have for the viral titers or the, the viral prevalence in those locations. There are a lot of people that contributed data to this that are listed here that you can see. Uh, and what I want to show you now are the prevalence data. That is, what proportion of colonies were infected? And at the top, 
you can see the top light, the top row, shows a pie diagram. And the pie diagram represents those colonies of the four locations in which there were no Varroa mites, the green locations. And the bottom row represents the red locations where there were Varroa mites. And each pie chart then shows what proportion of colonies were without a virus and what proportion were with the virus. And these are the 14 viruses that we screened. And what you can see quite clearly is that the statistics are down below. There are many viruses that are more common, that are more prevalent when there's Varroa present than when there is no Varroa present. In other words, they are much dirtier, our honeybees, much more infected with Varroa mites than without. Black queen cell virus is the commonest virus. Deformed wing virus is here. You can see it becomes more prevalent with Varroa mites than without Varroa mites. It's one that is uh, transmitted by Varroa mites. Black queen cell virus is more prevalent, but it's not known to be transmitted by Varroa mites. And it's thought to be rather benign. Now, we screened these colonies using PCR. QPCR and I think many of you nowadays will be acutely aware from SARS-CoV-2 of what QPCR means. This morning I heard on the radio, German radio, a politician talking about corona infections and quoting that if a, a CT value of less than 30 by, by PCR meant, or, or rather higher than 30, meant there was little infection, there's uh, little risk of um, transmission. So I realise qPCR is now, a, um, now very familiar to uh, a much broader audience because of um, COVID. Anyway, back to the data. What the qPCR can do is tell us how much virus is in each bee. And what you can see summed across all those locations is that honeybees without varroa mites tend to have a low viral titer with varroa mites have a they have a high viral titer and when we split that between those 14 viruses 13 of which we detected there are just one virus which is which really sticks out and that's deformed wing virus that is at a higher titer with varroa mites than without uh, we can comment on that uh, virus black queen cell virus is a marginally significant so summarizing synthesizing these qpcr results what we find is that black queen cell virus and deformed wing virus particularly genotype a at the time is particularly associated with varroa mites it's at high load high titer and it's at high viral prevalence yep so it's at this little box the red box the danger box. So it's that virus that really sticks out of amongst all the common viruses that honeybees have that's associated with varroa mites. And this is exactly what Stephen Martin showed in 2012 in Hawaii, that on Hawaii locations where which were invaded by varroa mites, the honeybees had a very high titer of deformed wing virus and basically all of them had deformed wing virus in them. So how prevalent is deformed wing virus? So this is a you know, virus that I've focused on a lot and particularly in relation to spillover. Uh, how prevalent is it in our honeybees? Well, I'll just show you some data, uh, a little bit of data now from um, the US. This is a nice paper by Kirsten Traynor and colleagues uh, who screened hundreds of honeybee colonies uh, from 2010 to 2014 across the USA by qPCR and here you can see a range of different viruses they comment extensively on some of these other viruses that seem to be increasing over time potentially but what is what is really for me so stark is that here you see the deformed wing virus prevalence is up to 100% of colonies infected and I'm going to tell you now something you won't probably like. But any and every colony that has varroa mites in it almost certainly has deformed wing virus in it. And as most, if not all, colonies on mainland GB and uh, mainland Ireland have got varroa mites in them, every colony has got deformed wing virus in it almost certainly. And that's something to think about. 
This is a virus that's quite aggressive, quite virulent, and it's in every colony. Now, I'm just going to show you a little bit of data about our screening across the country of honeybees. We've collected 30 honeybees from 26 sites in 2011 and screened them for deformed wing virus. And this is the map that we can generate from those. You can see here a heat map showing deformed wing virus prevalence on honeybees that were collected in the field on flowers. These are ostensibly healthy honeybees collecting nectar and pollen. And you can see there's up to 30, 40, 50 percent of the honeybees have got uh, deformed wing virus. Actually, this, this is genotype A in them. Uh, here, Juliet, I'm sorry to say, down in Cornwall, uh, up to 60 percent of the honeybees had DWVB in them that were collected on flowers. So there's a lot, you know, over half the honeybees on a flower have uh, DWVB in them and sometimes quite high titers. We've been back to those locations in 2017 and resampled, including not far from where Juliet is, are uh, the honeybees and checked them again for deformed wing virus, sampling in exactly the same way and screening them using qPCR. And what we find is that there's still reasonable prevalence. We've got about 30 to 40 percent of the honeybees uh, with uh, DWV in them. Notice that it's changed from DWV A to principally DWV B that is in them. And uh, we've recently acquired data from Germany and Italy that show more or less the same over the time span. These are samples uh, that were collected across about a five to seven year time period. We can see DWB has grown in prevalence. It seems to be taking over from DWVA. It's a bit like Omicron now taking over from uh, Delta uh, in uh, the human population. So we've got DWV increasing. I'll just point out these ones. In Germany, there's a couple of hundred colonies that are screened, not by ourselves, but from the German reference laboratory. Mark Schaefer, very kindly, screened them. Almost all of them have got DWVB in them. Uh, these are all uh, actually uh, collapsing colonies. So it's really prevalent virus. Okay, so let's get to, back to spillover among bees. So here's our conceptual image. Now in terms of spillover, in terms of bee to bee transmission, honey bee to honey bee transmission then, we've got the varroa mite which we think is principally responsible for transmitting from honeybee to honeybee. And here we've just got a, a quick image showing that. Varroa mites moving from one bee to the next, reproducing on pupae during spring and summer, moving on then, being phoretic as the uh, adult bee emerges and then moving into another pre pupa or a L5 instar, actually it is, larva and, and then reproducing on the resulting pre pupa and pupa. So there's a lot of transmission, certainly by varroa mites. And that transmission is probably between colonies as well, as those varroa mites drift with either robbing or drifting workers. The question now is, to what extent are those honeybees that are highly infected or infected and seemingly sometimes quite highly infected, even if they seem quite healthy, to what extent is that virus getting into bumblebees as well? So we've got then honeybee as a reservoir population, almost certainly for deformed wing virus, probably also for black queen cell virus, which was the most prevalent virus we've we found and we find regularly in honeybees, although seemingly not particularly virulent and not being transmitted by varomites, but it's still in honeybees. At flowers, presumably, or as they go out of the hive, they may be interacting with other bees, for example, bumblebees that can act as recipient hosts or alternative hosts. To what extent is that happening? So I'm going to refer now to some older data in 2011 where we collected honeybees not only did we collect honeybees we also from those 26 sites collected bumblebees two species of bumblebee the coding here shows you which species of bumblebee were collected and we screened them also for virus and what we found is for deformed wing virus we found on the left this is the pattern combined dwv a and b combined prevalence of honeybees, uh, a virus in honeybees. 
in a heat map. So we again, we can see Cornwall down here and Essex or East Anglia uh, being hot spots for deforming virus in honeybees, up to 60 or more percent of honeybees at flowers having deformed wing virus. In bumblebees, we found more or less the same pattern. Not identical, but statistically very similar. Admittedly, the prevalences were rather lower. Only 20 to 25% of bumblebees were infected with deformed wing virus in these hot spots. But nonetheless, the similar pattern, suggesting that they are sharing this virus. That there is some spillover. It doesn't show directionality, these data, but it does suggest sharing. And given that the prevalence is that much lower in bumblebees than in honeybees, the obvious implication is that it is from honeybee to bumblebee. We sequence the virus, not the entire genome, but a small fragment of the genome of the virus in honeybees and bumblebees at five of those sites and then generated a phylogeny of those sequences showing how similar the viral sequences were in the different hosts. In red are the sequences that were taken out of bumblebee hosts and in black are the sequences that were taken out of honeybee hosts. And what you can see on this phylogeny then here, we have the location where the samples were collected, honeybees and bumblebees, given by this colour. And I think if I've got the colours right, my eyesight's not so good now. My colour, my, maybe there's a bit of, from the screen, uh, colours might be a bit distorted. But this blue here, light blue, seems to be L, which is in site L, which is in Essex. And what you can see is the honeybees and the bumblebees have identical sequences at L. And they are slightly different from the sequences at X, which is Cornwall, we'll go down to Juliet again. Sorry for, for picking on you, Juliet. Blame Norman for that. Down at X, the honeybees in black and the bumblebees in red have a slightly different sequence, but it's identical within Cornwall, amongst the bees within Cornwall. And the only way of getting that pattern is, is if there is ongoing transmission in that year, in 2011, as we collected the samples. So not only is the honeybee heavily infected with deformed wing virus, it's also seemingly sharing that virus with the bumblebees at that very location in that very year. So we've got pretty good evidence of pathogen sharing. Directionality, still something of an open question. Is that transmission happening on flowers? Well, almost certainly it's happening on flowers. It's happening in summertime. Just to pin that down, we've undertaken some additional studies in Halle now. I'm going to give you some new data in Halle. So there's a lot of suggestions in the literature that that pathogen sharing is happening at flowers. And here are two articles, recent articles that I've cited here, of bumblebees and honeybees in the US sharing virus, deformed wing virus, presumably having picked it up on flowers. So, you know, the idea that flower, flowers are the source or the, the location, the transmission hub for deformed wing virus between honeybees and bumblebees is shared by many others, as in this example here, these two. We've collected honeybees and bumblebees at sites around Haller, and this is a terrible map, but Haller is somewhere here. Here's Leipzig and here's Dresden. And here you can see big red crosses of where we've been collecting honeybees and bumblebees. And I'd like to thank Christine Hesse, master's student, for undertaking, at least from these seven sites, this work, identifying the bumblebees, looking at the flower richness and monitoring which bumblebee and which honeybee is flying on taking nectar and pollen from which flower species, and then screening those honeybees and bumblebees at those sites, also for deformed wing virus, and actually black queen cell virus as well. Now, from those data, from the field work, where we go through a site and record which bumblebee is visiting which flower, which honeybee is visiting which flower species, we can set up a so-called plant pollinator network, or flower visitor network. 
What you can see at the top are they the bee species, the honeybee on the right, uh, and then these three common bumblebee species, Bombus lapidarius, Bombus terrestris, and Bombus pasquorum. And then what you see is we've got 276 observations of a honeybee visiting a flower. And most of those visits were to this flower species here, Arcticum. Some were to a cardus, a thistle. Uh, there were a very few visits of the honeybee to these Trifolium repens, uh, Cersium arvensi, and Vicia here. Now you can see where Bombus, the bumblebee, the red-tailed bumblebee is visiting. Most of the Bombus lapidarius, the red-tailed bumblebee, were visiting either this plant species or this plant species, which is the same that the honeybee was visiting. So clearly there's a lot of overlap between these two bumblebees in terms of the flowers that they're visiting. The honeybee, though, at this particular site, visited fewer flowers that the Bombus terrestris was visiting. Some, yeah, but there's less overlap. And Bombus pascorum, it overlapped with very little indeed. So we can quantify that using these uh, plant pollinator networks, this bipartite network, we can quantify the amount of niche overlap, the degree to which honeybees are sharing resources with these three different bumblebee species, Bombus lapidaris. And you can see quite clearly with Bombus lapidaris it shares a lot and least with Bombus pasquorum. These were generated for all, all sites that we visited. This is just for an example from one site. This is a mean across all sites and you can see it's, it's consistent, the niche overlap of, of the three bumblebee species. And now we can look at the prevalence of virus in those three bumblebee species and the honeybee. Here's the pattern that we see. In the honeybee, they are the ones that are heavily infected. Over 75% of honeybees had either black queen cell virus or DWVB. Actually, we didn't find DWV genotype A. It's all, we don't only have DWVB around nowadays in uh, Eastern Germany. You can see the pattern of prevalence in the three bumblebee species is reflective of the pattern of resource overlap with the honeybee, suggesting that it is indeed at flowers where these bumblebees are picking up the virus, where a bumblebee has little resource overlap with the honeybee, and that's the case of Bombus pascorum. It does not have very much virus in it, deformed wing virus and black queen cell virus. And I should say we've sequenced these virus variants so we can see they are the same variant in the same location. Bombus lapidarius shares a lot uh, of resources with the honeybee and overlaps a lot. And if we just plot those data out for these seven sites, we've extended it to 14 sites and we get the same pattern. If in a site there are honeybees that are heavily infected and they are visiting a flower species and there is a bumblebee that is visiting those same flower species, it also will be heavily infected. So there's um, more independent evidence that uh, the directionality is honeybee to bumblebee at flowers of the virus so question is you know the viruses is being shared maybe it's going from bumblebee also back to honeybee not just from honeybee to bumblebee or you might say robert you know you're assuming it's going from honeybee to bumblebee but that's just an assumption so we have undertaken a set of laboratory experiments to try and tease apart at least try and quantify the degree to which transmission takes place and here i want to thank anya tehel uh, a phd student working in the group uh, and she has undertaken an experiment in which she has in infected bumblebees or honeybees using dwva through injection and then she set up an experiment so the experiments you know in the laboratory they mean taking bumblebees out and injecting them and putting them in cages and then taking out honeybees from colonies and injecting them and putting them in cages and uh, what she's done in this experiment is to have cages with donor bees and recipient bees and sometimes the donor bee is a honeybee 
And sometimes the donor bee is a bumblebee. The recipient bee may be a honeybee or maybe a bumblebee. And you can see how she's coded this is uh, donors are in red. So they've been injected by us with DWVA. The recipients are in green. They have not been injected. And you can see she's done honeybee to honeybee, honeybee to bumblebee, bumblebee to honeybee, bumblebee to bumblebee. And of course, control cages where neither is infected. And she's done an experiment where the bees are mixed. And she's also done an experiment, and I think this is rather neat, where the bees are not mixed, but the feeder is always taken after 24 hours from the infected bees to the non-infected bees. And after 24 hours thrown away and the new feeder moved across. So there's no physical contact. And the results actually are rather identical between the two. Let me show you what happens when the honeybee is the donor. The honeybee is infected. Then the recipient, if it's a honeybee, it becomes infected. And here what you can see is uh, the titers of virus in the recipients, which is almost like in the donors. Uh, this is the proportion of cages where we see transmission. So the recipients are picking up virus when the donor is a honeybee. The same for bumblebees. Bumblebee recipients pick up virus from honeybee. When the donor is a bumblebee, when the bumblebee is infected, we don't get any transmission. So whether it's a honeybee that's a, a recipient or a bumblebee that's a recipient, there doesn't seem to be any transmission. Now, this I've shown as an absolute, which was the case in this experiment. I think it's probably a consequence of titer, uh, actually. So it's probably the case that there may be some transmission, but very, very little. So indeed, transmission seems to work really well from honeybee to bumblebee, whether it's just through the food or through physical contact. But from bumblebee to honeybee, it works very badly or not at all. So if there is transmission, and we're talking about DWV is a quite virulent virus in honeybees. It is not good for them. It does kill them sooner or later. And it probably shortens the, uh, the life of a honeybee by 50%. At least we found that in cage experiments. The question is, what consequence is it having on the other hosts? The alternative host or the recipient host? And if you're interested in pathogen spillover uh, more broadly and the consequences that it has on alternative hosts, may I suggest that you have a look at the recent film by Jane Campion, the Oscar award winning The Power of the Dog, which I very much enjoyed and does have within it pathogen spillover in that case. The consequences thereof for an alternative host. I shall say no more. Great film it was. What effect does spillover of deformed wing virus or black queen cell virus have for bumblebees? So we have shown in a previous experiment in the 2014 study of First et al that when we fed virus to bumblebees we found that virus extracted from honeybees, and it was actually a mix of DWV genotypes A and B, we found that feeding bumblebees uh, with control solution in grey in with DWV in blue led to a, a markedly reduced survival, reduced by six days of those bumblebees, suggesting in that one experiment that bumblebees may suffer when infected by a mixed DWV inoculum, suggesting that spillover may be having an effect. Anya Tehel, the PhD student I mentioned before, wanted to try this further, not just with DWV mixed, but rather to separate between DWVA and DWVB, because we know in honeybees that DWVB is a little bit more virulent than DWVA. But she also wanted to test black queen cell virus that is found regularly in the honeybees and that we also find presumably spilling over into bumblebees. So she infected bumblebees either by feeding, which is probably the more natural route, or by injection and then monitored them. So she stuck them in cages and looked to see how long they survived. And then she also quantified how much virus was in them.
Now, the viral inocula were taken from honeybees, so these are honeybee inocula. When she injected them into honeybees, the control is in yellow. She injected in DWVA, it killed bees quite quickly. She injected DWB, it killed bees even more quickly. And when she injected black queen cell virus, it killed the honeybees really quickly, which when injected, black queen cell virus is incredibly lethal for honeybees. So these viral inoculars are on the right hand side. You've got the titers. You don't need to worry about that. The left hand side is the survival curve. You can see survival is at one here. Everybody's alive at day zero. And by day 40, everybody is dead. Um, but we can see here the viral inocula are virulent. They are working in honeybees. When you put them into bumblebees, either by feeding or by inoculation, she found no effect. Look at the survival here. We've got survival. Everybody, all the bumblebees are alive at day zero. They all die by about day 50. But there's no significant difference whether the virus is fed, whether that's DWVA, DWVB or black queen cell virus. It doesn't seem to be infecting the bumblebees. And when it's injected in, also, we didn't seem to find an effect. And we wondered, why is this? We found it formally, you know, are our conditions in the cage benign with the surfeit of food so the bumblebees are not suffering? They can withstand this uh, infection, although honeybees cannot. They seem to be more robust anyway, the bumblebees, at least the commercial Bombus terrestris that we used here. So she tried a, an additional experiment where she starved some of the bumblebees and then tested them. And when she did that with the, exactly the same setup with injected bumblebees when starved, then she did find a slight increase in mortality. The bumblebees that were injected with DWVA did die a little bit more quickly than control when under starved conditions suggesting there may be a condition dependent virulence of the virus when it spills over. So to try and explore that a little bit further to go from the laboratory into the field outside in a real life situation, although using commercial bumblebees, we tried out another experiment uh, in the last two years in which we have infected bumblebees, again, as I've shown you already, either by feeding or by injection in the laboratory and then introduce them into field colonies of bumblebees. These are commercial bumblebees in which we add our individually marked bumblebees and then monitor their survival over time. And here you can see another survival curve here. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to thank Tabea Streicher because she is the PhD student that's really pushed this experiment forward. So you can see Tabea checking out some of the bumblebee colonies, doing a daily survey of uh, survival of the individual bees to check on mortality. And what do we find? Well, now we're looking at bumblebees, again, commercial bumblebees that may be somewhat bred for their ability to withstand diseases. Uh, but what we can find is when we inject bumblebees and introduce them to the field, their survival is lower than control injected bumblebees that are injected with a control solution. So in the field, indeed, the virus does have some impact on a commercial bumblebee when injected. When we fed the bumblebees and introduced them into colonies, they were surviving uh, no different from control fed uh, bumblebees. So the median survival time is 12 days for these two different bumblebee groups, suggesting feeding at least of commercial bumblebees in a field situation. And this is uh, summarized across four um, separate colonies doesn't seem to have an effect. So we see some degree of effect of pathogen spilling over. OK, so what can be done then to limit that spillover? Well, keeping honeybee colonies clean, obviously, is an important factor that uh, plays a role because by keeping colonies devoid of uh, varroa mites or with reduced varroa mites means reduced viral titers, means there's going to be reduced pathogen spillover as well. But we've recently, this is last year, 2021, been interested in exploring the impact that landscape may have on that because the 
transmission that's happening presumably between honeybees and bumblebees and other wild bee species is happening on flowers. And uh, there's a lot of interest in Germany in particular by the German government in fostering organic agriculture, in fostering set aside with wildflower strips to try and promote bees. And bees meaning honeybees, but also wild bee species. And here I'd like to thank uh, another PhD student that's just started with us, Patricia Pluta, who's um, f pushing forward this set of experiments and observations. And in this case, we've got 16 sites located uh, in the German countryside, actually near the uh, city of Göttingen. And this is in collaboration with uh, Katrin Westphal. And each of those 16 locations has a varying amount of organic agriculture in it. So here you can see eight of the locations. And in dark green, you can see, I think this is a one kilometre circle radius around each location. And you can see some of them have got a lot of in dark organic agriculture. Uh, and some have little organic agriculture. Some have a lot of flower strips in them. Uh, and some have very few flower strips in them. And here's, here's one of our token landscapes. And in each of these 16, actually it's 32, but I'm just going to show you the data from 16 of these landscapes, two bumblebee colonies have been placed and two honeybee colonies have been placed. Now, the idea is to have a look at pathogen spillover, but I'm not going to show you that because we haven't got far enough to looking at bees in the field yet. I'm going to show you results that Patricia has recently generated looking at colony health in relation to land use, in particular in relation to organic agriculture and flower strips, the area of flower strips. Just a word about the colonies. So she sampled the colonies twice, honeybee colonies and bumblebee colonies, two at each site. So we've got 16 sites, 32 bumblebee colonies, 32 honeybee colonies, two at each of the 16 sites. There's a range of pathogens that they contain. We're screening for viruses, DWV, A and B, sac brood virus, black queen cell virus, acute bee paralysis virus. We're also screening for nosema, trypanosomes and uh, neogregarines and so on. A whole range of viruses, um, uh, um, other pathogens as well. And uh, then what she's done, what we've done here is uh, of those 11 pathogens, we score colonies telling us how many of these different pathogens are in the colonies. So some colonies have zero, very rare. Some have 11, very rare as well. Most of them have between one or two pathogens in them. And then we've related this prevalence of pathogens in honeybees and in bumblebees to the land that's use around and to the amount of organic agriculture and the amount of flower strips in those 16 sites. And what we see in the bumblebees so far is rather disappointing. They don't seem to respond. So we've got here the percent of organic agriculture in the surroundings of those 16 sites per site and the parasite richness, the numbers of parasites per colony in the bumblebee nests. The same for annual flower strips. So the amount of pathogens in a bumblebee colony is not related at all, it seemingly, to the landscape variables that we've measured. So maybe we're not measuring at the right scale. With honeybees, on the other hand, here's a, something positive that you can get out of this pathogen spillover talk, is that the more organic agriculture there is, the lower the numbers of parasites in those colonies. And the more flower strips in the two kilometres around a site, the less parasites in those honeybee colonies. So it really seems as though managing giving more flowers to the, to the honeybees in this case seems to lower their pathogen load. Now, there could be many causes of that, better nutrition leading to better health of the honeybee colonies, are, are better able to withstand parasite attack. It should theoretically also lead to a dilution effect of any pathogen transmission and pathogen spillover at those flowers as well as a consequence. OK, so I've got to the end of my talk. I want to come back to this image again of the uh, rinder pest, which has now been eradicated from the world, this RNA virus. Uh, and I'm going to suggest to you there is maybe an ostensible analogy then between rinderpest in cattle and DWV in honeybees. 
to what extent it's really affecting wild bees, including bumblebees, we're not certain about. But we can be sure that the spillover is occurring, pretty sure, and that it must be having some consequence. The magnitude, though, still is open. So take home messages then, DWV, and particularly nowadays, also in the UK, DWB is widespread. It is a killer. It is virulent. Pay attention, everybody. You need to control Varroa to keep virus levels down of this virus. DWV is also spilling over into wild bees, but what effect it's having is an open question. I'd like to thank people that have funded the research that I've spoken about, particularly I've got here the funders of the most recent research that I've spoken about, which are EU or German funders, Ministry of Agriculture in this case, German Ministry of Agriculture or the DFG Research Council. And I'd like to thank you as well for your attention. Thank you. Robert, a uh, lot of really fascinating new material there. OK, so the, the, the first question is, how does the transmission on the flowers take place? Uh, is something deposited on the flowers or is it airborne over close proximity? And the second question is, do we know anything about transmission from honeybees to other pollinators other than bumblebees? Uh, yeah. And so, the so the first, it can be answered uh, very well by... Um, the work already published from Alga et al. and uh, Alga and her colleagues, uh, Burnham et al. 2021, Alga 2019. They have been working with Bombus impatiens in the East Coast USA and have done some very nice experiments where they infect honeybees, put them, onto, put them in a cage, uh, in a flight area and find the same virus turning up on the flowers. They do the same for bumblebees and find the same, that the bumblebee is also leaving virus and bumblebee picking up virus from flowers where they place the virus on the flower. So almost certainly it's happening. It's being deposited presumably in feces or in saliva or uh, secretions that are given out presumably in small quantities it could be hyperpharyngeal could be mandibular at flowers when taking nectar or when collecting pollen so these bees are dirty they're they're disseminating virus and it's almost certainly uh, stationary i can say last summer we checked some flowers out around the apiaries here and had no trouble picking up black queen cell virus and deform wing virus. Deforming virus on flowers that had been visited by honeybees. No problem whatsoever. So deposition. Second question was... Uh, the second question is, is there any information about other pollinators other than uh, bumblebees? Yes, so we screened, um, and part of the Voodoo Project is screening a large number of other bee species. They are also found in other bee species. Yes, and that... Uh, uh, I think there's been a paper out by Nanetti et al, 2021, in the journal, I think it's the journal called Viruses, one of these MDPI journals, that uh, document recorded um, evidence for deforming virus in other organisms. And it's not just insects, it's also other invertebrates. I'm, I, might I might be exaggerating by saying 90, 100 different species. It's a phenomenal number of species that deforming virus has been found in. And it really does seem, in the same way that SARS-CoV-2 seems to be something of a generalist mammalian virus, it's not specific to bats, it seems to be a generalist and easily transmits. My suggestion is that deforming virus is something of a generalist virus in insects, and not only insects, we know it replicates in uh, Varroa mites, that's, and they are uh, Chelicerata, so uh, arthropods, but again, outside of the uh, class in sector. So it's quite got a quite a wide host range. Mm. Right, next question. Going back to your heat maps yeah. uh, uh, of the UK, where you, where you had close correlation in the sort of southeast and southwest, but the question was, in, in Scotland and Wales, there seemed to be a considerable difference. Yes, that, that one 
there. Yep, I'm going to um, get. Yeah. Did you have any explanation for, for why there isn't a, a, a sort of link up in in Scotland and, and Wales on those maps? This one. Yeah. Um, is that is this is the map that you're looking at? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. why is that? I think in uh, the northeast of Scotland is just a, a, an inference. We didn't sample up there, so it's just a um, uh, a quirk of the um, the program that we've been using to infer the uh, prevalences from those 26 sites. But it, why there should be a, a hotspot down in Cornwall and why in Essex, I don't know. I mean, it could be something to do with um, the uh, management density of honeybees. You know, generally pathogens are at higher prevalence in their hosts where the host is at high density. Uh, and at low de uh, at low prevalence, whereas at low density, so that might explain the the east um, or the um, East Anglia hotspot. Uh, why in Cornwall? I don't know. Are there lots of um, beekeepers that go on holiday? No, with I, their I, mean, a, I, I think Devon probably has the highest density uh, of honeybee colonies. Cornwall less so, and, okay. and much of East Anglia, the density is quite low actually. So, so I I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Yeah, open yeah. question. Uh, and the second part was, um, open do we know uh, about transmission of pathogens that are more common in other bee species into honeybees? That was okay. your question, wasn't it? Yeah. So uh, the what I found quite surprising of our most recent German data, uh, it's just a little bit reflective of the data that we find in the in Britain but have a look here at um, acute bee paralysis virus this is in bumblebees it's quite prevalent in bumblebees it generally quite low in honeybees so by the same token if I say to you honeybees have a lot of DWV and it's probably going into bumblebees because DWV in bumblebees that's low prevalence by the same token one would argue that it looks like APPV, acute bee paralysis virus, might well be reservoired by bumblebees and going in the other direction. Uh, in terms of the trypanosomes, Crithidia and Lotmaria, that are apparently quite widespread in honeybees, impact of which we don't really know so very well. Uh, and it could be that they are being shared quite widely. Nozema, by I should mention, was quite low prevalence in, in the studies here, and we generally don't find Nozema apis anymore, mainly Nozema serrane. Mm. Yeah. So, they could, so it could be that, um, you know, the more we look, the more we find viruses and other pathogens that are resident of bumblebees that may occasionally be spilling over into honeybees, certainly. Mm. Interesting. So at the front here. So, so the question was on your injection and feeding experiments where, where you were uh, feeding bumblebees, was that only in the laboratory or were you releasing them into, into the field uh, as well? So in this experiment here, uh, we released into the field bumblebees with DWV genotype a that we had taken out of our honeybees we've got one more question so the the, the question is that uh you know where, where you have uh plants in a in a garden or whatever where you have several species on them the the, the question is is it is this related to the uh tongue length uh in other words there are bees with similar tongue length on the, on the same flowers and and therefore should we be extra careful about protect uh, you know ensuring our honeybees are uh, are healthy uh, to avoid spillover to to other bees. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. So we know very well that there is a relationship between tongue length and the flowers that are, are preferred by bees. So indeed, one could conceive of planting, uh, making mixtures of flowers, uh, a diversity of flowers that can would help to both reduce spillover and also promote a diversity of different bee species. So that would be a really good idea. And I realize that some of the some of the uh, officials in Germany are getting their heads around that at the moment in trying to redesign seed mixtures to try and uh, tr try and facilitate 
you know, or, uh, benefit a wide range of different species. Good idea. Good idea. Mm -hmm. And the more, the better. Probably a natural time to, to end. <laughs> uh, so thanks very much for the, the wonderful talk uh, and You've the got... stimulating questions. Yep. Thank you very much.